Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Good morning, Sam. Man, it's great to have you on. I'm excited to uh, kind of hear about your journey. And it's the same kind of flow of the show that we always have. If you can give our listeners an idea of where you started, where you are now, and how you got there. Sure. So you want to do that all in one question? Sure. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So I started, it was a while ago, it was back in 2002 is when I bought my first rental property. Uh, I was in the computer business before that. I was actually an IT trainer for computer certifications. I was making a pretty good bit of money. I was making about 150 a year in 2002. And at the time, you know, before that, I was investing in the stock market. And of course, that's like going to the casino. And uh, and so after the, you know, the dot-com bubble burst, I yanked all my money out as fast as I could. And I'd lost everything that I'd made, but I still had about 130000 that I had invested. So I still had that available. And I thought, okay, so now what? And it seemed to me like at the time after spending, you know, a fair amount of time researching different investment strategies, it seemed to me like real estate was the best way to go, at least for me, for not just the long-term wealth, but also for the cash flow, which is what I primarily focused on. So, and this was back in 2002, man, there was no Facebook. There was, I don't even think Google was around. I think I was still using Alta Vista or web crawler or something. There were no meetups, uh, you know, many of the resources, uh, bigger pockets wasn't around. I don't think Rich Dad Poor Dad, I think Kiyosaki was still poor at that time. So I don't, it was a long time ago and, uh, and I just had to figure it out. And what I did was I put together an Excel spreadsheet because I got tired of like sitting down, like, you know, with a hand and a calculator and I thought, well, shit, I know how to use Excel. Let's put together a spreadsheet where it kind of does some of the math for me. And what I was looking for was a cash on cash return on my investment. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking at appreciation. I wasn't looking at mortgage pay down, which both can potentially add a significant amount of, to your equity over time. Right. I was really looking at the cash flow. And at the time I set for my minimum, I wanted a 30% cash on cash return. Meaning if I put $10,000 out of my pocket for the purchase, I want to make 3000 over the course of a year. And that was after deducting my mortgage payment, which, technically isn't an expense. It's a capital expenditure, but it's money out of my pocket. So to me, it's an expense. Sure. So after taking out, you know, taxes, insurance, principal, interest, possible repairs, I guessed a vacancy rate of 10%. After like taking all those things into consideration, I started looking for a property that would fit my criteria. Now the first one, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I always go back to girls. It's kind of like your first date. Like the first time is like scary. It's like, shit, what if I do this wrong? What if it doesn't work? And, you know, I had some fear. I mean, and it's kind of smart fear. And my thoughts were that what's the worst thing that can happen? She's a, she's crazy. I never see her again. Everything's good. I get a property. A year later, I decide, man, this is not for me. You know, the tenants are crazy and the city's crazy. And, you know, and then I sell it and I lose a few bucks. Okay, that's that's the risk. But the same risk is if you invest your money in, you know, Tesla or IBM. I mean, you might make a fortune in the short run and then you might lose everything in the long run. Right. So I went ahead and I took the plunge and I bought my first building. And at the time I had this lofty goal. My wife wasn't working. You know, we just had a son. She was staying at home for a few years and she went back to school. And so I was a 1099 employee, which meant like, if I don't work, I don't get paid. Sure. There's no, you know, we've had health insurance that I was paying for, but there's no vacation time or personal days or any of the other stuff that people get today. Like, you know, guys stay home from work because their wife had a kid. Uh, I didn't have any of those luxuries. So what happened was I thought if I get hit by a car or I say something like inappropriate in school and get fired from my job, like, you know, then how am I going to pay my bills? And I thought, man, the rentals, like if I can get like, you know, 15 or 20 rentals, I'll make enough money off those to at least pay my most basic living expenses, you know, so I, we can put food on the table and pay our mortgage and keep the lights on. And that's how it originally started. Uh, and then what happened was it was, I guess it was maybe a year or two later that I started to meet other landlords. When I, you know, the first year I didn't know any other landlords. So I was really out on my own, but I started to learn these other strategies and, uh, of acquiring more properties. And at the time when I first started, the the typical investor marketplace with the banks was you could put 10% down. Wow. 
and you pay the closing and then you buy the property. Well, as you, if you do the math, you know, if you're, you know, if you spend 10 grand to acquire a property after, you know, for me, after, you know, 13, 14 properties, like I'm out of money, like I can't grow anymore unless I just keep saving. And that's, you know, that could be a slow process. And is that what after, happened? Well, after a couple of years, I figured out that I did some cash out refis because the, the market was still taking off like a rocket from 2002 to 2000, maybe seven. And when I did the cash out refis, I took that money. I was still cash flowing well, but I got all my money back, which wow. meant in effect, I was like, you know, I own these properties with nothing out of my pocket. I was still cash flowing well. And then what I did was I took that money and I bought other investment properties. I didn't do something stupid, like put an addition on my house or go buy a, you know, $80,000 car, right? Because that that's dumb. You know, you people do that, you know, they get a 30 year note and then go buy a car that's gone in five years. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And so what I focused on was what's the best way to spend my money in the long term? Because everybody wants a Tesla or, you know, or whatever your car choice is. Everybody wants a nice car and a big house and all that stuff. But is that yeah, what I was thinking is, is that best for me in the long term? Like, what's my long term goal? And my goal shifted uh, around 2005. I was thinking, you know, man, if I just keep doing this, I can just quit my job. My wife's going to have a job in another year or two when she finishes school. I can just quit. And I'm like, I'm out of this stuff. And that's what I did. Uh, you know, it was probably three or four years in. I think at the time we had like 40 units, 30 to 40 units, somewhere in that range. And between the income from that and her new job that she got, I was able to actually like get out of IT completely. So the last time I got a check from another company that wasn't related to real estate was probably around the end of 2005, probably about three years into this career that I, that I started. And, uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, no, this is great. Keep going. You're doing, you're okay. doing great. So, so I really want to hear, you know, you know, so you bought 30 or 40 units. Were all those single family at that point? Uh, well, the first one I bought was four units. It was three units and a very large garage that was rented for 250 a month to a guy that used it for his HVAC business. So let's talk about that for a second. You split the house from the garage. Yeah, it was you, already it was already separate, and when I bought it, all three apartments were rented, and the garage was rented separately. Got it, got it. That's I mean, that's courageous because you're like you said, you, you, you this is 2002 when you first started out, so there's not like there's you know like you said, no meetups, no no blogs, no bigger pockets. There's there's nothing nothing really to guide you. You just went out and and kind of it was me and it was me and XL man. That XL was my friend. Wow. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, that's great. Good for you. So you made it to 40 units. You said, Hey man, I'm out. I'm done. I'm I'm closing out the W2 and I'm going to continue doing real estate. And that was 15 years ago. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. About that. So how did you, how did you weather 2007, 2008? Cause I mean, I know a lot of guys who cash out refied in that period and then found themselves upside down. Yeah, here's for me, this was my thoughts on it. And this still holds true even today. Uh, I was never, I was in it for the long run. Like I wasn't planning on like, you know, for guys that are flipping houses and stuff like that, like they got burned because it's like, all right, you just renovated this house. You're all in for 300. You were going to sell it for four. And now it's worth 275. Like those guys are in trouble. Yeah. For me, I mean, even if it was worth 325, they're still in trouble because by the time they pay the realtor, they're still upside down. Yep. So for me, it was always the focus was on the cash flow. And so just make numbers up that are very simple to follow. The first building I bought was $75,000. If I'm making $300 a month on that, it doesn't matter if the building is worth $150,000 or $10,000. I'm making $300 a month. And that's all that I cared about. Right. Incidentally, I did sell that building a couple of years later. And I put about $15,000 in it. I think I sold it for one hundred and eighty. dollars Okay. So I made a ton of money on that. Right. And and it was kind of like dumb luck. Like I, you know, I don't ever bank on appreciation, but I was fortunate to get it. Sure. And then I took that money and I bought more investment properties. So that was also a part of what was enabled me to keep going. The big thing that worked for me that enabled me to really take off like a rocket, like 2007, 2008, I was good. I was actually wholesaling full time at that time, making more money than I'd ever made in my life. And I'd probably, as of today, I've probably wholesaled about 200 deals. And uh, 
when the market changed, of course, the wholesaling fell apart, but I was good because I had enough rentals and cash flow off that, that I was good. And I never really, as my income increased, my standard of living increased much less than what my actual income did. So I always lived below my income, below my means, which turned out to really be a big help, not only for just weathering the storm, but also being able to accumulate more capital to, you know, improve my business. And so around 2008, in the meantime, between 2005 and 2008, something happened that changed everything. I wish I could take credit for this. I thought I invented it. It was the Burr system, the buy, renovate, rent, refi, repeat. I figured that out on my own. Like this was, there was no bigger pockets or nothing, but I was thinking, cause I did a couple of retail flips and I was, and I always had this fear like, man, what if I rehab the house and I can't sell it? Well, then right. I'm stuck with a house I don't want. And then I thought, well, my numbers, I'm all in for 70%. I can refinance this and just keep it as a rental. So I thought, okay, well, that's my way out. Fortunately, all my retail flips sold. But then I started thinking, well, instead of doing, you know, retail flips using hard money, why don't I use hard money for to buy investment properties and then just refinance out to pay my lender back? And if I, my numbers are right and I'm you know, do my homework, then there should be enough equity in there where refi is going to be easy. And I could pretty much be in properties with, hopefully, if I do everything right, with nothing out of my pocket. The first deal that I did that with was a 15-unit apartment building, or a 15-unit building. It was eight vacant apartments that needed a renovation. And there were seven commercial spaces. The apartments hadn't been lived in in years. They were, you know, pretty much shells. Uh, and I borrowed hard money for that. And I did the renovations, uh, got all the apartments rented out. And then I refied with a local bank. It was back then, it was First Mariner. I don't, I think they've changed ownership a couple of times, but it was a local bank that did the refi. I paid my hard money lender back. I was in the property with not only nothing out of my pocket, but I had a few hundred thousand dollars in equity in the process. The building appraised at a million dollars. I was all in it for, with the purchase and renovation, maybe 600,000. Now, I didn't believe the appraisal at a million dollars, but as long as the banks believed that that's all I cared about, right. I thought I thought maybe 800, which would have still been, if I got a loan at 80% of that, I would have still been able to get you know all my money back. So, uh, so that's the first Burr deal that I did. And again, like there was no RIAs that I knew of, there were no meetups or anything. And I, I thought I figured that out and I was like, shit, I'm gonna keep doing this. And another thing that I learned that was really a, a big help for me was that the, the ability to network, to get to know other people in this business, as many people as you can, absorb as much information as you can, maintain your reputation at all costs. You're somebody that gets shit done. If you say you're going to do something, people, they know they can trust you. If you tell them the condition of a property, even if you're going to wholesale it, they know when they get there that what you told them is true. You didn't hide anything or play any games or anything like that. And if you can do those two things, if you can have a great reputation and network so that you know people know who you are, deals come your way. It's just the, the way of the world. I mean, if you found a great deal in Baltimore, you'd be saying, man, who do I know in Baltimore that I could trust? Hey, let me call Mark Owens and see if he's got any interest in this. Man, that's like, that's the life's blood of this business. Mm -hmm. And uh I've seen knuckleheads that, you know, try to get over and, you know, play games and they have to work like three times as hard as me and they make half the money I make. Right. You know, they're always looking for new victims. You know, and for me, it's like I get a property under contract. I want to wholesale it. I've got like four or five people I call and one of those people are going to take it. You know, I don't because they know, OK, it's Mark. It's a good deal. You know, and they trust me. Right. I can keep doing business with the same people over and over. And that makes my life a lot easier. So the. Once I discovered discovered the Burr method, uh, what happened? I'm going to just tell a quick story just to illustrate the power of networking. So I, this guy John in, lives in Pennsylvania. I don't want to mention his last name, but John, uh, I sent him a wholesale letter about a property, and he called me. We talked on the phone for a while, and we seemed like we kind of hit it off. And I said, "Listen, man, if you're down in Baltimore, I'd like you to take you out to lunch." So we ended up meeting for lunch, and I did this a lot. And uh, he asked me, he's like, well, what are you looking for? And at the time I was looking for 10 units and up apartment buildings that needed renovation. So he says, okay, that's cool. And we left. And then a couple of days later, he called me back and he's like, Hey, I got a friend that's got an 18 unit. It's vacant. The banks 
it's a bank owned property. You interested in it? And he gave me the address and the price. And I went and looked at it and I called him up and I said, hell yeah, I'll, I'll take it. And uh, I paid a $40,000 assignment fee. Wow. He got, he got half of it. And the guy that got it under contract who I'm, and I'm still good friends with both of these people. And I just, I met this guy Al through this deal and, uh, and ended up acquiring the 18 unit used hard money, did the you know renovation, got it rented, did a refinance and got all of the money back, like nothing out of my pocket. And again, several hundred thousand dollars in equity. The point of that story is the value of the networking, the value mm-hmm. of talking to people. You know, I don't care if it's a newbie that's, you know, that's still, you know, working on their first deal or someone that's been in it for 30 years and just hates the business. I mean, the more people that you know, the more deals that are going to come your way. Right. Form of you getting the deals, or if you find a deal and you're looking for a buyer, like, man, the more people you know, you know, then the more qualified, hopefully buyers that you know that you can afford the deal to. And it sounds like that's the way that you've really grown your business is just by networking. It's been a huge, huge part. Absolutely. What, uh, so what are you buying now? Are you still, I mean, it's, I mean, you obviously you started off with, with kind of singles and now you're going to all, you know, 10, 15, 20 units at a time or, or what, what, like, what's your buy box look like now that you've kind of graduated up to bigger, bigger deals? Yeah, the, I'm still buying single families and it's funny because every year I say, I'm not buying anymore. I'm done. And then I think in the last year I bought three more houses. So I just, I get bored or I got I need work for my guys that work for me. So I, you know, I'll go buy something that needs complete renovation and the numbers might not be the best, but it's like the benefit is financial, but it's also keeping my guys busy. So mm-hmm. I don't lose them because that's the hardest part of the damn business is finding people to do the work that do good work at a reasonable price without, you know, coming in drunk or ripping you off. Right. Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. So you're still buying single family, but, but have also been able to find a kind of a niche. It sounds like in the, in the smaller uh, multifamily space as well. Yeah. You know, I, I love the smaller multifamily space. There's a secret I want to tell about that is that they don't cash flow as good as single families do. Really? Yes. If you, and this is the gurus aren't going to tell you this because they're busy selling their courses and all that stuff, but here's, (laughs) Here's the way it really works. So if you got a 15 unit building versus 15 houses, the 15 unit building, you're going to have a lot more turnover and turnover kills your cash flow. Why do you, so, why, can I, can I ask, can, can I interject a question here? Why, yeah. why more turnover in a 15 unit building versus a single family? I'll tell you, because the, for one, the population in apartments is usually more transient and that the units are smaller. So if you've got somebody that's running a 1500 square foot house and they've got three bedrooms full of furniture and a living room full of furniture and a dining room and a whole basement full of furniture, man, they're not trying to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. So they, they might be there for an average of maybe six years. Right. The apartment, right. maybe two, two and a half years. So you're dealing with a lot more turnover. The other issue, and this isn't really a financial issue, but it is an issue, is whether you manage it or a property manager takes mm-hmm. care of your properties. The uh, you're going to have personality issues in the apartment building. This, you know, people calling you up, complaining somebody's radios up or somebody left their stinky shoes in the hallway or somebody left their laundry in the dryer for three days. And, you know, somebody didn't put the trash in the dumpster. They set it next to the dumpster. So you're going to be dealing with a lot of personality stuff, which I don't like that doesn't bother me so much. But it is something that you never hear about. But it is a fact of the business. So the. Uh, the multifamilies they're harder to find, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, for every, you know, 10 unit building that needs renovation, you can find 50 houses that need renovation where the numbers are going to work. So they're a lot more difficult to find. I got the majority of mine after the, you know, the crap hit the fan 2007, I guess, 2008. It was after that, that I found most of my great deals. I got a 14 unit that was vacant that needed a renovation. I got the 18 unit that was vacant that needed a renovation. I got a seven unit that was vacant that needed a renovation. Uh, but a bunch of houses that were in the same condition. Were, were you never concerned when you looked at these vacant 18 unit buildings? Were you, was there never the thought in your head that I may not be able to fill this? Nope. Nope. Not at nah, Baltimore. I can't speak for other parts of the country. Sure. But for Baltimore, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff like any big urban city, but uh, it's a gold mine. Yeah, there's so wh- a ton of money. Why were why were the, why were these units vacant? Like, why couldn't the previous I, owner I, fill them? I have no idea. It was a, when I bought it, it was the bank owned it, and they had taken it from whoever owned it previously. 
And, uh, you know, I think it was probably just like really poor management. I mean, at this business, it's not for everybody. And sure. I manage my own units. Other people wouldn't be really good at it. I'm good with it. I work an hour or two a day at the most. And uh, with despite having over 100 units, I don't I delegate and automate like most of my stuff. If, you know, all my bills are paid automatically. Uh, I mean, even the contractors, I can pay half them through you know, cash app or Zelle or something like that. So I don't even have to write a check to send them. I can like literally be sitting in my car at a red light and, and pay my HVAC guy. Right. Uh, in fact, I'm getting a furnace installed today from a new HVAC guy and I'll be texting him to see if he does cash app <laughs> because right. if he does, I'll be paying him, you know, this afternoon. Right. Right. Yeah. Those are, those are things that are, that are monster time savers. Mark, let's jump into the final four here. If we can, yep, sure. you've got, you've got an amazing uh, amount of experience, you know, obviously in the single family, in the small multifamily and also in the wholesaling side. So I'd love to hear what the one piece of advice you would give to an aspiring investor. What, what would that one piece of advice be? Man, it's really, it's, it's hard to differentiate between the two, but I would say that number one would be network your butt off. Like the more people that you know, and that know you, the more opportunities that are going to come your way. Gotcha. That, that's the first thing. The second thing, which is kind of equal is your reputation. You know, you can know a thousand people, but if you got a sucky reputation, it's not going to help you. So you need to have both. You can have a great reputation, but if you don't know anybody, then that's not going to help you either. So they kind of go together. Gotcha. Gotcha. What's one thing you're currently doing to stay on top of your game? Oh man, <laughs> what am I doing? The, you know, it's, it's kind of, this is an ongoing process. Just, you know, looking at your numbers and saying, okay, is there any way I can reduce this expense? Is there any way I can reduce this income? And that's like a game. I mean, like everything is great, but I'll even do it with my cable bill at my house. You know, I'll call Comcast and say, Hey, I'm paying $210. I think it's kind of high. I'm thinking about switching to somebody else. And then, you know, they knock 20 bucks off. I'm like, yay. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it, it, it's it, people say, man, you're worried about twenty dollars a month. It's like, man, it's two hundred and forty bucks a year. It took me twenty minutes, right? To, to say two hundred and forty dollars, it took twenty minutes, right? So that's that's what I'm constantly looking for is just ways to make things more efficient and you know and reduce expenses and add income. Right. No, that's great. That's brilliant. Uh, when it comes to giving back, what's one thing you're doing to make the world a better place? Oh man, what am I doing? Uh, aside from dealing with my tenants on a very personal level, I just I recently joined a volunteer fire department. Really? So that's, yeah, that's completely unrelated to real estate. And I uh, start my emergency medical responder class in uh, in a few weeks. So I'm looking forward to doing that. And uh, it all started out as a I saw a thing on Facebook, of course, where a local volunteer fire department was looking for rescue divers. Uh, to, you know, if somebody falls off a boat, somebody's going to go, you know, find them. And I've been scuba diving for 25 years. And I thought, well, I can, I mean, I'd help with that. I don't, you know, it's not going to be like, you know, something that's like fun or exciting, but, you know, it's something that's useful that people need, you know, to bring right. clothes to their families and stuff. So I started with that. And then I thought, man, you know, this ambulance thing, just helping people like that would be like a really good thing to do. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm currently working on. Wow, that's really cool. So obviously you live in an area where your fire department is based on the volunteer fire department? Yeah, we have both. We have paid and we have volunteers. Huh. Well, that's really cool. That's really cool. Well, good good for you. They work really well together from what I understand. I haven't actually attended any, you know, like, you know, like any catastrophes yet. I just joined two months ago, but I'm still getting my training done. But uh, yeah, from what I understand, they work together very well. Right. That's awesome. Mark, thanks for your time. If our listeners want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, probably my email address, mark at markowens.com. I also get a Facebook group. Uh, it's Mark Owens, R-E-I. Just do a search for that. You'll find it. And it's just like a local landlord group. If you're looking for like bigger picture stuff, then I started a Facebook group called the Maryland Investors Network. And I think there's, I don't know, like 15, 14, 15,000 people on that. Uh, but that's, yeah, those are the easiest ways. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's awesome. Mark, thanks so much for your time. Certainly appreciate it. Hey, you're welcome, man. Take care. Thank you.